I'm speaking today with uh, Professor Phoebe Barnard, um, Chief Science and Policy Officer um, for the Conservation Biology Institute. She's also one of the, uh, the authors of the World Scientists Warning to Humanity Group's paper about the climate emergency that we are currently in. Um, and I wanna thank you for co-authoring that paper and for bringing it to the world's attention. Because as you and I know, the situation is far more urgent than our governments are letting us know. And the reasons for that are complex, but I always bring them in <laughs> during our conversation. So, so Phoebe, would you start us out? How would you like to go with this? Well, thank you so much, Stuart, for inviting me. It's an absolute honor and privilege to talk with you. You're somebody that I have admired greatly for a long time. So uh, looking forward to discussing this. Uh, you started with mention of the World Scientists Warning of a Climate Emergency paper. And I had been invited to collaborate on that paper, uh, partly because I had an extensive government career, mainly in Southern Africa, uh, but also because I balance a scientific career with a policy uh, analysis career. And uh, so I, I'm now, since the publication of that paper last November, uh, I feel really, really driven. <laughs> I have many fires in my belly. One of the greatest ones right now for me is uh, I feel driven to help the implementation of, um, of the six core areas of that paper at different scales, at different levels. And I'm starting with where I am living now in the Pacific Northwest and working with cities, counties, legislative districts, and states, as well as the Pacific Northwest bioregion. Yes, and that's the strategy we've got to go for. We have to implement at all levels. Um, there's one of, the, one of the people we're working with, this gentleman, Mark McCaffrey, who's a curriculum specialist. He and friends came up with a, uh, a schema called Powers of 10. You're familiar with it? Yes. Yeah, where you want to take the implementations that are sweet spots for the size of the community you're working with. Okay, and there is your uh, your your chief uh, executive. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is my chief comfort and happiness advisor. Yeah, <laughs> with there you me. go. <laughs> okay, your watchdog. Wonderful. Okay, so um, I'd like to discuss some of those implementations a little bit later on, but first let's go through through the schema of the, uh, the six areas. And here we go. And this is the schema, the six areas um, that are covered in the uh, uh, scientists' warning of a, a climate emergency. Can you go over them for the part of our viewership who uh, is not familiar with them? Sure, and I know most people watching this may have some familiarity with the, the different world scientists' warnings, and particularly the world scientists' warning of a climate emergency. But what I find is that that really hasn't yet permeated into mainstream culture. And so um, we had six core areas where it was agreed not only by the five of us co-authoring the paper, Bill Ripple, Bill Muma. Uh, Thomas Newsom and Chris Wolf and myself, uh, but by the now 13,000, I think 700 and something scientists co-authors, that these were core areas where humanity really needed to focus our efforts uh, to try and make big transformative change in the next decade. Maybe let's start at the quickly at the um, upper right. Atmospheric pollutants include some of the short-lived compounds that tend to uh, get up into the atmosphere and cause ex excessive global heating. Carbon soot uh, from factories, uh, methane from poor management of agricultural manure and so on. The fluorohydrocarbons. fluorocarbons of all kinds. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, then and hydro hydrofluorocarbons, hydro which are even worse, you know. So yeah, yeah, yep, absolutely. And so we need to pay at the uh, pay some attention at the strategic policy level and global policy level how we 
um, manage those pollutants, but that can come down to a very local level. And I live in an agricultural county here in Washington state, Skagit County, where manure management is a thing, for example. So these are things that can have multiple scales of action and impact. Population stabilization is an uncommon thing for many scientists to talk about, but it's really been the elephant in the room and it's received uh, an unfair amount of uh, silence, I think. Uh, part, partly <laughs> unfair because amount of silence, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been perceived as something that is just not okay to talk about, but I'm a woman. I've been living in Africa most of my life. Most people there want to talk about it. Um, most women certainly want to talk about it. And in the Northern Hemisphere, it's also become un unfortunately uh, bogged down in finger pointing. Is it, is it population? Is it hyperconsumption? Well, it's both. And mm -hmm. And so our schema uh, addresses them both. But with population stabilization, we need to really invest in programs that are, you know, bringing out educational opportunities for girls and women, providing family planning support, providing supportive policies and so on, so that we can undertake a, a, a leveling off of our population uh, curve as smoothly, as stably, as non-coercively um, as possible. Yes, what we want to avoid is that nature takes care of that for us and we go from an exponential increase to a uh, radical decline. Uh, yeah. as some people say that we're headed for that currently. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, this is a brag of sorts, I, I like to say that at COP25, the annual climate talks in Madrid uh, last year, the program I put in, uh, put on in over the subject of overpopulation was the only event over the 12 days of that that conference that dealt with population at all that mentioned it at yeah. all as far as i know yeah it's, and, it's and there, there are good reasons honestly that people have become wary of it and and i think we need to yes. talk about that frankly historically it's been spoken about by people who may have vested interests, people who may have, uh, shall we say, patriarchal tendencies. So one of the things that I've been doing is just starting a dialogue of women globally, uh, particularly from Africa, South America, Asia, and uh, get women talking about their own personal choices, their own policy uh, goals, their wish list for the world, and how we engage in it. Um, so. That, that's the population stabilization bit. And, then and one of the other six core areas was relating to a shift of economic goals. Many of us, I think, are like myself, I realized years ago that all of my efforts, all of our global community efforts towards averting climate change, towards protecting biodiversity and ecosystems were really to to put it delicately, just shouting into the wind if we could not shift the way we structure our economy. It's um, funny how the other metaphors for that, for what you just said, shouting in the wind are also graphic. Shall they're graphic it. and they need to be, but maybe this is a family yeah. channel, so I'll try to be delicate. Let, but Let me interject there because sure. this is the one that I've hammered away at for years that the current economic system that we are saddled with, we have been tricked into thinking it's the only economic model possible. Yeah. And instead of calling it by its true name, which is neoclassical economics or growth economics, a hundred years after it was forced upon us as the only game in town in academia, we've learned to call it economics as though there were no other possibilities. This was a hijacking of the human mind into thinking that it was our destiny to grow forever. Uh, duh, nothing organic can grow forever within a finite container. And the last time I checked, the earth was a finite container. And, and economists, quote unquote, growth economists, that is, 
economists will argue the point that, oh, no, 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 if we run out of forests, don't worry, there's always bamboo or uh, natural capital is always, uh, uh, you can it, it substitute, there are always substitutions that can be made. Excuse me, excuse me. The coal tram that go into these devices is, is, a, uh, is not a renewable resource. And in fact, it exists in two places, China and in one of the least democratic nations on earth, ironically named the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, so you, the economic problem we've got is that we can't see through this film that's been placed over our eyes. So I'm sorry. I... And, and this is one of the most fundamental challenges of our time because there's so, there's so much invested in our economy and the way it works. And there's so many people unable to perceive an alternative, but also there's plenty underway already with well-being economic thinking and you know the well-being economy governments we go uh, that uh, have shown leadership from uh, Iceland from New Zealand from Costa Rica and uh, the, the work of Bob Costanza and, and others on this has and, and Lorenzo Fioramonti one of my co-authors um, have really helped frame how we can rethink uh, our economy and governance. And, and that is our biggest challenge, I, I think. It's, we, we are going into a future where we need to achieve pretty significant transformation at the psychological, social, economic, political levels. And to do that all at once within about a decade uh, seems to be pretty difficult, if not impossible but I believe it is possible. We may just need to have such a swift kick up the butt to force us to do that. But what has been 2020, except a swift kick up the butt yes. with wildfires, with pandemics, with hurricanes, with uh, pronounced and violent racial inequalities and, and, and protests that bring us all to a stark recollection of what is broken with our society that we've been ignoring, that we've been hoping like a, like, like a, a, a badly broken uh, foot that you can't fix with a cast, that we just limp along with it and hope that the pain will go away, but it doesn't. Yeah. Um, let, let me flip back to the upper left. And you know, a lot of what is discussed with climate change is rightly and understandably about energy because it is our fossil fuel economy that has brought us to the point of disaster. And so the recommendations around energy from our world scientists warning of a climate emergency paper were about getting off fossil fuels, but specifically about conserving energy as well as transforming energy to a, a significant renewal, uh, renewable energy basis within this decade, by 2025, by 2030, and certainly by 2050, we need to have made, you know, the, the big transformative shifts that we need to talk about. And of course, all of these are fundamentally linked and you don't have to think more than a few seconds to start to understand how these six areas are interlinked. But linked to energy and linked to atmospheric pollutants and population and, and the economy and to nature and land, which I'll come to in a minute, are our food systems. There are nearly 8 billion of us on the planet and we have started to use land so wastefully and started to consume so much meat and so much dairy uh, and therefore to pile up nutrients that in that are poisoning our ecosystems that this is one of the fundamental things that needs to change eight billion people eat a lot of food every day how can we take our current wasteful system and shrink it to a manageable more local more uh, more more plant-based system that regenerates the soil that uh, protects and conserves existing uh, conservation and, and ecosystem services. 
Yeah, and there will always be people. Let me um, stop the share for a moment. There will always be people who will not give up their burgers and ribs. Um, there's going to be people who hold on to prefer me to like, and um, I work with all avenues of thought. Uh, Alan Savory is someone who, who uh, believes that the proper management of livestock actually would help us sequester carbon. There are plenty of farmers in Namibia that I know who use those practices so, uh, so pretty successfully. For, for those people who I work with them as well, who are, are uh, extremist vegans, <laughs> vegan or die, you know, um, there's a place for them too. They're at one end of the spectrum. And yes, we should be more moving to plant-based. Some of us can handle veganism. Some of us can't. I would, I can't right now. I have cancer. And sure. um, if I had a, a raw vegan diet, I would quickly die. So, I, you know, the, the world is a complex, busy place. And there's nobody suggesting that the world should be uniform. That's authoritarianism. And none of us want that. What I believe we said in the paper was a shift towards more plant-based diets and everybody can do that. But um, the, the thing that I think is uh, a useful technology that is uh, disruptive in this line is really the, the, the meat alternatives, which are actually delicious. I grew up eating meat. For, for years, I still really hankered after the taste of it, even after I became a vegetarian uh, at the age of 13. But I've started eating Beyond Burgers, for example, and there are some different really good uh, meat alternatives that are so delicious and, and they're chemically filling a lot of the same needs that our body have for for meat alternatives so Good yes there, uh, for for meat so yes there there will be people always that really can't survive on a vegan diet and i certainly wouldn't be the person to say that they should yeah. but with eight billion of us even those people that <laughs> are willing to die for the right to eat meat will um find it relatively easy most of them to just stop eating it every day, stop eating it three times a day, like the pig farmers that I once was uh, privileged because they were lovely people to share a house with in Pennsylvania while I was an intern. Um, we can make big changes to our food systems and therefore to the wastefulness of land that, that we use. But especially we need to stop farming in a way that destroys soil. Yes. And much of the West uh, the way the West does agriculture destroys soil. And that is one of the biggest crimes against humanity and the planet that we can possibly do. So just being aware of that simple fact and restoring carbon and soil ver invertebrates into our agriculture is really, really important. And it's pretty easy to do. We just need to stop and realize that we are on a hiding to nothing when we have destroyed our soils or allowed them to run off into the sea as anyone who has flown over Madagascar or Southeast Asia can see. Yeah. Enormous plumes of sediment and soil into the ocean. Topsoil washing away. And, yeah. and this is, can be pretty, blame can be pretty squarely placed upon the chemical uh, agriculture industry that wants to addict you to the poisons and addict you to the seeds that will resist the poisons. And It's killing our soil. It's killing our bodies. Uh, sometime we should have a discussion about what I call uh, human colony collapse disorder. Yeah. And my daughter <laughs> suffers from it. I love uh, it. Autoimmune inflammatory illnesses uh, brought on by our post-World War II organic chemical uh, industry. Mm. And, and how it's invaded our food systems. Good. But finally, uh, I wanna get to the topic uh, perhaps closest to my heart, although virtually all of them are close to my heart, and that is nature and land. Yes. 
we have a number of things that we can and must continue to do. One, we are managing forests badly. And the, uh, the symptoms of this are everything from these catastrophic wildfires to the uh, bark beetle infestations around the world in whatever country. There's usually pathogens affecting trees because we are managing our forests badly. And so we need to stop doing that. Two, we need to invest in making sure that trees grow to maturity and that the ecosystems around them, including the soil and the mycelial fungi in the soil, all can survive because they are crucial to our carbon budget and to our biodiversity and therefore to our food security. And, and so planting trees is fine in some circumstances where they already occur so that they can grow there ecologically. And we know that it's such a bad idea to plant trees in places where they don't naturally occur, like the tundra, because this actually darkens the earth and increases the ability of the earth to absorb heat. Um, but planting trees is no good, basically, if they don't survive to maturity and start to really be able to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. And one mature tree is worth dozens, if not hundreds, of little saplings. So yes, people need I... to re remember that. And, and then thirdly, um, we are coming into the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. And where all else has failed, then we need to start investing in ecosystem restoration. But fundamentally, if, if you remember nothing from what I say, apart from this, we need to stop land transformation as soon as possible. And this is foreign to our thinking in most parts of the world still, but we have to do it because land ecosystems are so important for carbon sequestration. And every time we dig up a new patch of land or cut down a forest and convert it to suburban sprawl or to, um, to, to uh, crops, then we have lost fundamental ability to store carbon. So we've got to stop land, sequ uh, land transformation and focus on carbon sequestration and biodiversity. The, the, the term land transformation is not sufficiently, for me, is not a su sufficiently clear one because what we're talking about is the ruination of land. Yeah. Um, we, we need to, nature does need half of what's out there. And yeah. we, need to, we need to observe some notion of leaving it alone is the best strategy. I know the program that I did with uh, uh, Dr. Mumo, Bill Mumo, at um, COP25 in Madrid, we made that we tried to make that point very clearly that if you if you adopt a um, uh, an idea that well we'll let trees grow for 20 years and then we'll cut them all down and use them for pellets or that ain't it that ain't it because at 20 years of age they're just kind of reaching their stride on drawdown of carbon dioxide. And yeah. that most of the, the drawdown is, is canceled when you harvest them at 20 years instead of letting them go for another 20 or 30 or 40 or whatever their maturity is. But, you know, so, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, of something that was attributed to the, uh, the CEO of some forestry company where he said, when I see a tree, what I see is a pile of hundred dollar bills sitting on a stump. Yeah, and, and yet trees that are 800 years old or more are still being converted into wood pellets and toilet paper and other, you know, just detritus of our consum hyper consumptive yeah. global economy, uh, linear economy, and we need to convert that to a circular economy and protect those trees. It's, it's a crime against humanity. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So we've made it, I think, all the way through your, your six points quite eloquently with some, some digressions here and there. And I think we have a tremendous amount that will make it to the final, the, the final cut of 
the final edit of this conversation. Um, and although we don't usually like to let them go longer than a half hour, this one certainly deserves that or deserves to be split into uh, two parts. Um, so let me, let me just ask if there's any, uh, anything else that has struck you that you want to include I, I think I'd just like to uh, encourage us all as we approach these times to bear in mind history and to look outward. Those who may be watching from North America, particularly the USA, or even from uh, Northwestern Europe, are not always equally inclined to look backwards or to look um, at other countries and their solutions. If we look at the lessons of history about societal collapse, and there's been a fair amount said about this from polymaths like Jared Diamond uh, to historical journalists like David Keyes, who wrote a wonderful <laughs> but very solid book called Catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we can see that climate change, whether it's natural cycles in the past or volcanic eruptions, they tend to set the same things in motion. They set in motion diseases. And we have seen this now because of our globalized uh, system of procuring medicines and meat, social unrest and economic instability, and therefore the downfall of governments. And there is a very, very well established pattern here. Do we need to fall into that same pattern as though we don't have brains and that we can't learn from history? I don't think so, but the jury is still out. We tend to be, as a species, so reactive, so self-obsessed, that we may end up just falling into the same pattern. It certainly looks like that uh, so far, but I don't believe that we aren't better than that. Mm -hmm. I do believe that we can change things. The world does not have to be this way. <laughs> we already are changing it. People need to get involved to change it. It's only to make sure that some people Species, some kids of the future can get spat out the other side and really have a chance. But if we sit and bicker about it and point fingers and uh, get all prissy about institutional issues, then we are not going to be able to in achieve the transformative change at all levels of our beings and our society that we need. Yes. Now, I, while you were saying that most eloquently, I, I couldn't help thinking of the rather famous quote, I don't know who it's attributed to, that those who don't study history are condemned to repeat it. But yes. we'll get that in, in white letters over black screen as, <laughs> as in yeah. part of our, our final edit, I hope. Yeah, I can't remember who that is. I'll try yeah. and look it up. I would say Mark Twain, but it doesn't quite have enough cut in it. No, no, it was, it, it's, uh, it's back before Churchill, um, and, and of course Mark Twain was before Churchill, but it, it's of, of that kind yeah. of uh, world leader statement. A, a, a statesman said it, not a, uh, a, yeah. a, a sarcastic journalist, but uh, thank <laughs> yeah. you very, very much, Phoebe.